Michael Pipich, welcome to Shrinkwrap Radio. Dr. Dave, it's great to be with you. Thanks very much. Well, it's great to have you here. I've been enjoying this new book that you've written. It looks like this for my listeners to, and my YouTube viewers to see. It's uh, in less than 200 pages, not really fat. You have put a lot of material in this book, which is titled Owning Bipolar, How Patients and Families Can Take Control of Bipolar Disorder. So I have to ask you, how did you become interested in bipolar? I've been a therapist for over 30 years now. And That's hard to believe. <laughs> I mean, looking, you look like a young guy. <laughs> Tell me about it. It's hard to believe. <laughs> um, and it, over that course of time, I treated um, a variety of clinical disorders and relationship uh, issues and dysfunction um, in, in uh, adults and adolescents in a, in a broad range of problem areas over that period okay. of time. Uh, but uh, over the past several years, and maybe uh, 15 or so, about half that time I've been in practice, uh, I, I've been receiving referrals from local uh, treatment facilities uh, with people with the uh, discharge diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And, and um, as those individuals were coming into my practice for follow-up care primarily, <clears throat> they were often uh, accompanied uh, at one point or another by a family member, if it was a young person, typically a mm. parent or two. Um, certainly um, an adult might bring in a spouse or a caregiver um, to, to kind of share in that initial uh, contact, uh, receive information and education on what uh, needs to go uh, forward with, with respect to their bipolar care and so forth. So as that was kind of happening in my practice, nothing that I really particularly sought after, but kind of sought me after, if you will, uh, I realized that it was important to really understand what bipolar disorder is and what's required uh, at that level of care. Um, not that I was completely unfamiliar with it, but as I went uh, kind of deeper into that research uh, and, and spoke to patients and families in, in that um, uh, therapeutic context, I realized that there isn't uh, in my opinion, enough available to really understand what bipolar is uh, mm. from a diagnostic standpoint, but also from a treatment standpoint, and for the purposes of uh, family education and family empowerment uh, in, in being a supportive part of that person's care uh, moving forward in their life. And, I'm surprised uh, to hear that because we've known of bipolar, right, for a long time. And uh, there must be a ton of books out there. Well, I think there's a there's a there's been a lot of information, but let let me share with you at least from my perspective, um, and and I like to think that thirty plus years uh, is, is supposed to give you some sense of wisdom and, and and broader perspective of these things, and I think from uh, in the sense of bipolar, for me it, it certainly has. Um, when I was coming up as a therapist during the 1980s, thereabouts, um, at that time lithium had just become I think pretty popular uh, as a treatment for mood stabilization for patients with bipolar disorder. And um, even though I've had, I had some terrific mentors and beautiful teachers, I think there was at that time sort of the conventional wisdom coming out of that lithium revolution that all you need to do for people with bipolar disorder is to get them on medication and that was actually the terminology that was used, let's get them on medication. And with that, I think there was a real reduction in how we viewed psychotherapy for mm. uh, bipolar disorder patients and, the, and, and certainly their supports, their family and loved ones and so forth. And, and, I, and I do believe in this, again, my, my position of observation uh, and my own experience and, and reflection and all of this kind of tells me that that there was a generation and then, and then another generation of therapists that were just kind of given that as, as, as the ideal um, with respect to treating patients with bipolar. Again, get them on medication, whether it's lithium or whatever the mood stabilizing agent would be uh, in an, any individual case, and then they'll be okay. Yeah. And oh, as oh, opposed man, to, move them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as opposed to how we treat any number of other clinical disorders Certainly, those that um, you know would require or would be um, 
uh, have some benefit from medication, but also mm -hmm. the therapy component and how we bring those aspects together, I felt was really missing. And I think that that's largely why it was a, it was coming out of that lithium revolution and it was so great that people could get on medication in a way that they never had before in history. But again, something was diminished uh, from the yeah. therapeutic uh, standpoint. Yeah. And as a result, um, and I find when I train clinicians, and I do that quite frequently as well as do um, uh, community-based um, um, presentations for patients and families, I also do clinical trainings for uh, clinicians like myself for diagnosis and better treatment approaches. And, and, I, and that's been the feedback that I've received over and over from people in my workshops that I didn't learn this in graduate school. I didn't learn this stuff in my training. Mm. I, I, I just realized how little I really know about bipolar disorder from a diagnostic standpoint and the urgency uh, that very often is present in, in meeting those, uh, those various clinical needs. That's fascinating. Do we know if bipolar is, is on the increase? It seemed, I sort of feel like I hear more about it than I used to. And I taught for many years and I had students who would self-identify as bipolar. Um, is it increasing? Has, is it being more diagnosed than it used to be? Do you know anything about that? I, my observation is, first of all, that Bipolar has been and has been with us since recorded history, and mm -hmm. um, it, it, bipolar disorder is a more recent, as you know, uh, term. It's historically been known as manic depression, and yeah. there is actually um, cases from physicians um, in from ancient Greece um, that have documented uh, patients with mania and depression, and. So I think it's been with us for thousands of years, maybe more. Yeah, you cite a, a bunch of famous people early in the book who uh, retrospectively have been diagnosed or considered to have been manic depressive. Exactly, and uh, and many famous and um, and important people with regard to their contributions to civilization through the years were um, uh, likely. Uh, manic depressive or had, had uh, bipolar disorder. So uh, kind of going to your question, uh, we seem to notice it more, and I think that that's a very good thing. What I think is happening is because we're having discussions like what you, you and I are doing today is increasing that sensitivity and awareness about the presence of bipolar disorder around us. And from a clinical perspective, knowing that um, the, the most recent research shows that about two-thirds of all bipolar patients have been misdiagnosed at some point in their lives. The very fact that we're talking about this and really, again, raising that consciousness about uh, the prevalence of bipolar disorder may make it seem like uh, it's a fad of sorts. You know, sometimes mm. people are concerned, like it seems like everybody's yeah. bipolar these days. I, I think it's similar to like if you, if you go out and buy a car, uh, the next day, it seems like everybody around you bought the same car, right? Yeah, you just right. kind of have that increased um, yeah. awareness about it because you're thinking about it, you know. Uh, but I do think that it's been around uh, around us for many, many years, many generations. It is a genetic disorder, and it is passed down through uh, family generational lines as well. So I think we're we're elevating the conversation about the presence of bipolar disorder, and it may make it appear like it's it's an increase, but. I do think it's an epidemic of sorts, but I think it's always has been. We just know more about bipolar itself, hopefully, yeah. and we're more uh, cognizant of the various consequences, including the very high rate of suicide, along with substance abuse and all kinds of other things that co-occur uh, as a result of bipolar disorder. Okay, we'll get into some of that in, in more depth as we go along. The title of the book, the main title is Owning Bipolar, which seems curious. You're talking about cars, you know. Uh, I would love to own a Porsche, uh, but I don't want to own bipolar or any other diagnosis. So uh, how'd you come up with that title? What is it, what is it that you really want to get across with that? Okay. Well, a couple of things. First of all, that I think is important. Again, bipolar disorder is predominantly caused by genetic factors. Okay. And um, from there, uh, 
um, we have uh, certain catalysts that can really stimulate the symptoms that we see behaviorally in, in a, any individual at some point in their life as a result of uh, hormonal changes in adolescence or in the case of women with postpartum bipolar onset, certainly those changes internally as well as life adjustment issues can certainly bring out uh, the bipolar in the way that, again, we can recognize and diagnose. But its foundations is ge are, are genetically based pre predominantly. Okay. And, and I think that's the first uh, part of why I call this owning bipolar. It's, it's something that is nobody's fault. There's no, uh, you, you don't have bipolar because you're a bad person or you did something wrong in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's coded in your DNA, you came onto the planet with it. Um, mm -hmm. But even though it's nobody's fault, and there's no reason to point fingers either at the self or the people that have bipolar disorder, it's important to understand it at its root causes, what its effects are all about, and how to manage this disorder through good treatment and good support, which is based on knowledge and education. So it really is about taking responsibility for bipolar in one's life. And that's the first part of owning it. The other aspect is because there is unfortunately so much misdiagnosis and mistreatment uh, around bipolar disorder, I feel that patients and families with the right knowledge, the right preparation and understanding and knowing what to look for, and to some extent what to expect in treatment, they can be empowered as they go into treatment and as they go through those phases of treatment with their treatment team in a collaborative way, not necessarily in the traditional way that we go to a doctor, we tell the doctor what's, what we're feeling and the doctor dispenses medications or other treatment and we just kind of follow the program. We know yeah. that people with, with bipolar disorder, um, that, that, that very often is not effective. But with knowledge, empowerment, and a collaborative approach to treatment, which is, again, owning bipolar. Um, people can have much, much higher degrees of success in the stabilization process and in their lifelong process in, in terms of how they manage that uh, for their future. Yeah, so part of what I take from owning bipolar is uh, the message that, uh, hey, it's too bad, but you've got this and you've got it for a life. So you either come to terms with that <laughs> And uh, in a kind of self-empowering way, or and I'm wondering um, how big an issue stigma is around this particular diagnostic category. I mean, in general, we know that mental health for the general populace often carries a lot of stigma. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, in general, as you say and very specifically to bipolar. And, and perhaps as we know more about it, it not only helps to uh, um, reduce that stigma, but as, as, as we know historically when it comes to mental illnesses of all kinds and sort of the history of psychological disorders and how they've been looked at by society and at times treated by uh, professionals, um, the, the language kind of changes. It becomes more uh, casual, if you will. So stigma can be, I think, perpetrated by any number of things and sometimes even in, with the best of intentions. But to just call somebody bipolar because we don't like their behavior because they're changing something on the fly or whatever, or it just seems like a kind of an easy way to describe somebody's behavior that we don't like for one reason or another. Um, is is kind of one of the things that I think people who do have the disorder and do take it uh, from very seriously in their lives and, and take their treatment very seriously are, feel like they're up against. Along with, I think, the more historical context of how uh, we as humanity have at times looked at people with certain mental illnesses as being pariahs in our society or scapegoats or subjected to uh, judgment or prejudgment uh, based on the fact that they're struggling with something that very likely is neurologically based, very likely is not something that they chose to have in their life. Uh, and, and even though I think certainly my experience is that from a society standpoint, 
some things are much better as, uh, compared to what uh, you know I've witnessed again when I was starting my career. Uh, but I think we do have a long ways to go as a larger community in treating these psychological disorders uh, in the same way that we would treat any kind of medical problem. Right. Both from, a, from, a, from a professional standpoint, but also, again, within our communities, how we talk about these, uh, these things and, and what people need to do collaboratively to work together to make everybody's life healthier. And, and the conversations like these, again, I think go a long way to destigmatize. But certainly yeah. people with bipolar disorder, um, particularly when you're starting to talk about medications, uh, that's a big one. A lot of people will find themselves feeling a sense of shame or fear around me taking medications. I have heard more than one time somebody in my office saying, I don't want to take medication because it means I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. We really think about that statement. Yeah. That means I'm crazy. And it, it might even have a hint of irony in all of that. But I think what crazy means in that context is more about feeling shame about having to take a medication or having to sort of avail yourself to any kind of therapy or treatment that would, you know, help to, to, to make your life better. Yeah. You'll very much live in that fear, which I, again, has a historical kind of context to it. That, that we right. Know. Stigma. Yeah, yeah. The stigma really is a two edged sword in a way of, in part, it's, inflicted by others having a bad opinion or image of a condition, but also it gets internalized and, uh, you know, and we, we inflict it upon ourselves feeling like we have stigmata, if you will, mm -hmm. that other people can see and that other people will judge us. And I'm understanding families in your title, you know, uh, how patients and families can cope because I would think many times the family might have some mistaken notions about what's going on. They might blame the patient. They might think the patient's crazy. Is that right? Uh, yeah, unfortunately that does happen. But the good news is, provided that families and patients come together, yeah. and, and that's part of the early phase of treatment that I call the pre-stabilization phase. Um, then, then we can all get on the same page with the right knowledge and education. And look, I think, you know, we're talking about, you know, some of the pluses of living in this era where we're more open with, with these subjects and, and, and people have more access to, to feeling uh, a sense of community together. But there's that downside, too, of increased in information access, which is all the misinformation and horror stories that anybody can, can uh, hear about when it comes to treatment and, and, uh, and particularly what medications can and cannot do. So, so there, is, there is some pluses and there's some minuses in terms of that availability. The important thing is that patients and families get the right information and the right uh, professional type of care yeah. so, that we, so that we can begin to reduce those things. Now, there, there, there's gonna be uh, biases of all kinds. Uh, uh, sometimes, again, based on legitimate fears and concerns about treatment, which we can talk about, but also um, the variety of misinformation and horror stories. Sometimes it comes out of real life. I mean, somebody will say, you know, uh, my friend's mother was on medication uh, for depression or whatever and had a really bad reaction. I don't want that happening. Well, that's understandable, of course. So we have to kind of work through those similarities and differences to, to really kind of nail down what is appropriate for that individual that we're talking about. But also, there's cultural biases and, and historic family biases uh, very often, to one degree or another, I think, about mental illness on the one side and what it is to pursue mental health. And these are very often contributive to that overall defense of denial. Yeah. Uh, denial is very prominent in bipolar disorder, but is not limited to the individual with the bipolar disorder. It can be uh, prevalent in the family and uh -huh. in the, kind of a larger extended family culture. Yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah. So part of the value of this book, I mean, it's, it's it sounds like the enterprise, uh, a big part of the enterprise is psychoeducation, if you will, educating the patient, educating the family, uh, 
And I think it'll be useful for you and others to say, hey, take a look at this book here, if you would, because it'll help you to understand your situation yes. and where we're going to go. And also in this very charged political atmosphere that we have right now, I think I recall reading that somebody, a guy who was running for Senate in some state, I don't remember which one, dropped out because it came to, because he was concerned that people would discover that he had had psychotherapy in the past. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember if they said what the psychotherapy was for, but it really just underscores that we still haven't really graduated yet <laughs> as a society in terms of our understanding of uh, the value of psychotherapy. Well, I don't have all the background on that one individual. I did hear about that story, but that is very unfortunate. Um, that's somebody that may have gotten my book, actually. I would, I would prefer our politicians go through psychotherapy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. No. Exactly. Uh, we can blame maybe. them that we would really wish they would do that. Yeah, I think that's a qualifier, not a disqualifier at all. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, but you're, you're right. I mean, that's an example of how we do have a ways to go. Yeah. So in terms of the mechanics of, of bipolar, um, uh, there was a question. I, oh, yeah, I remember now. Does uh, everybody go through, uh, do, does everyone with this diagnosis experience both manic and depressive phases? For example, is, there, is it possible for someone to be bipolar and never experience mania or never experience depression? Um, let, let me answer first of all. That's a great question because um, we talk about bipolar mood swings um, pretty definitively. Yeah. And, and when people kind of get into trying to understand the particulars of bipolar disorder, it does get confusing. So there are really three basic types of bipolar disorder. Bipolar one, bipolar two, and then cyclothymia, which sometimes people call bipolar three, but it's, it's known as officially as cyclothymia. But if we focus on the one and the two, we can see some really important differences. And I talk about this in the book as well, because again, um, people hear these sort of things and, and, it, and it gets confusing in terms of what it means for for, for the individual with bipolar disorder and what the treatments would ultimately be all about. Um, so in bipolar one, in order to be diagnosed with bipolar one, you only need uh, to qualify with one uh, uh, episode of mania in your lifetime. So the diagnosis of bipolar one does not require a history of depression, just one manic episode at any mm -hmm. time in your life. Uh -huh. Even if it's not recent, it, it, it means that uh, you have bipolar 1 disorder, according to the DSM-5, the Diagnostic mm -hmm. and Statistical Manual, that, that psychiatrists and mental health professionals use to diagnose. All right. In bipolar 2, um, in order to have that diagnosis, one would need to have a history of at least one hypomanic episode, and we can talk a little bit about the difference there, and one uh, episode of major depression. So you do have to have major depression to have bipolar 2, but you don't have to have it for bipolar 1. Now, having said that, many people with bipolar 1 have had depression. But that's how we separate those disorders and separate how we think about it, and to some one extent or another, how treatment is laid down uh, differently in some cases between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Bipolar 1, the manic episode, is tend, tends to be more severe uh, sometimes, not always, but sometimes it has certain psychotic um, features to it, including hallucinations and delusions. But when that, only when that person is in that episode, not when they're not in that episode. Bipolar 2, we talk about hypomania, which technically means under mania. So it's sort of a zone below mania. A lot of the same symptoms, uh, but they typically are shorter in duration and because of that, they typically have uh, fewer consequences compared to that manic episode. And I think the idea is basically that there are people that can have periods of hypomania and function successfully provided they don't have 
a history of a major depressive episode at some point too. So it gives a little bit of flexibility in terms of mm. perhaps you talk about, about unique characteristics about that individual and, and how people can become creative and productive and so forth. Uh, that we that in a sort of a full blown, if you will, manic episode, we would expect there to be severe consequences and and requiring of uh, of treatment. Yeah. But, but the hypomania is kind of a almost on that borderline between uh, somebody who may be just a hard driving individual and relies on certain periods to be more productive and more creative, provided they don't have those depressive episodes. It's not looked at as a mood disorder. So those yeah. those are some of those differences. Yeah. Now, does it always start with either one or the other? Do some people start with mania and then get depression? Or do some people start with depression and then later mania appears? Yeah, it, it can be both. It can go either way. Yeah, it can go either way. Yeah. Uh, what I have found, though, in terms of presentation, a person presenting to outpatient therapy who's never been in the hospital for a mood disorder, necessarily, <clears throat> is that they tend to present either in that depressed state, in an episode of depression, or they more recently had an episode of depression. That, that to me is more, the more typical outpatient presentation. Whereas people who um, wind up in a psychiatric facility may, uh, certainly they may be depressed and suicidal, but very often they present with mania or recent mania because that manic episode has perhaps created the kinds of consequences, um, either personally where a family member got involved um, or, or some sort of legal disturbance or whatever where um, law enforcement um, um, uh, brought that person to, to the hospital or so forth. So it can go either way, but sometimes it appears differently. Um, <clears throat> one of the important things to, I think, keep in mind when the most recent episode, either current or, or within the past few weeks or months or whatever, has been depression, is that since bipolar is so frequently misdiagnosed, it's, it's more often than not diagnosed as major depression alone. And one of the problems with that is that if there's an antidepressant medication given to somebody who has, actually has bipolar disorder, it can induce a manic episode. So lots of times people come in and are diagnosed with major depression, which is not inappropriate given their most recent symptoms, either current or, like I said, maybe very recently in their lives. But without a further investigation to understand if they've had some sort of episode of mania or hypomania in their life, they may be given a medication that could actually make their bipolar worse and not better. And, and if, you're, if you're not aware of that, um, right away, sometimes what happens, unfortunately, is clinicians, <clears throat> patients don't necessarily know better. Clinicians might say, well, they're getting more agitated, more irritable. Maybe they need more of the medication or a different kind of antidepressant. And then that just makes the, the condition even worse. So it's always important to understand uh, if there's been any history of, of uh, mania or hypomania from the, from the clinical side, but it's also important for people to understand that. And um, in their own personal lives, but also within their family history, since it is genetic. If you've had a parent or a grandparent or somebody in your family tree that has had bipolar mood swings and you know that, that means that there is a fair likelihood you may have that gene. And it's important to bring that information um, in, in treatment uh, ahead of a clinician making a diagnosis and then prescribing medications. Is it more likely to travel through the male line? I don't. I don't necessarily know that. Okay. Uh, I, I do know that the that the that the odds, if you will, between uh, parent and child and grandparent, sort of that first generational line, parent to child, or second grandparent to child. I'm not a. I know there are experts in this sort of things to really understand how this all works out statistically. But from what I do understand, the statistics are pretty solid. So if, if you yourself have bipolar, but your um, um, spouse does not, for example, and, and you have like three kids, <laughs> there's like, uh, this is very, very basic, all right? 
but there's a chance that one of those three would have some form of bipolar disorder. If you and your spouse both have bipolar disorder, there's a chance that like two or three might have it. So I mean, the statistics are pretty evenly divided. Or again, if there's a grandparent that has one, then it may be a little lower incidence, but, but the statistics are pretty, pretty consistent among all individuals that there is a, a fairly good chance that that kind of mood disorder will emerge in that person's life at some point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's strongly genetic. I recall years ago when I was in graduate school, and this may have applied to just to depression rather than bipolar, that there was a stronger incidence of traveling through the male, the male line, uh, that the males were more likely if they had a, uh, a person with, with depression in their further upstream, uh, that they would be more likely to get it. I don't know. Yeah, if that I'm, may be true. I'm not familiar with yeah. that. Okay, well, moving right I along. I do know that it's pretty evenly divided uh, by gender. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, between more. males and females. Yeah. I think there is just, it's, it's like um, the ratio is like 1 to 1.1. So I think it's, you know, it's pretty much 1 to 1 evenly yeah. divided yeah. between males and females. Yeah. So there's this interesting kind of paradox between hypomania and mania. And I don't know if everybody's aware of that, but the, the hypomania person's particularly difficult to treat, right? Because they just feel good. They're feeling great. They're on top of the world. They're, they're feeling creative. And, uh, and maybe they're actually being creative. Whereas uh, the person who suffers from real mania, that person's kind of climbing the walls, right? They can't sit still, they can't, uh, yeah, go ahead, you're the expert. <laughs> no, I, no, I think, uh, you, you know, your observation uh, is, 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 is a solid one for sure. I, I always say that, and this is, again, we're talking in generalities, of course, there's exceptions, but I found that um, bipolar one, is easier to diagnose and harder to treat. And bipolar two is harder to diagnose, but easier to treat. Um, what makes bipolar two less recognizable, I think you just kind of pointed it out, particularly in somebody who um, relies on that energy to get things done, but because of the shorter duration compared to people with bipolar one mania, um, there's, there's less negative effects. That doesn't mean they don't exist, but they tend to survive those negative aspects and get more done. And, uh, and maybe that's, uh, to one extent or another kind of celebrated, uh, around them, uh, at least in the short term until things become for whatever reason, more untenable. Yeah. As a result of that, uh, repeated, uh, hypomanic pattern, uh, but also obviously if they go through periods of major depression, where you know it, the the mood becomes very dark, very desperate, very hopeless, and and potentially suicidal. Yeah. Um, whereas with people with the longer and typically more uh, consequential type of bipolar one mania, uh, they may start off productive and energetic and euphoric and life of the party and very lovable and and sexual and whatever, uh, but because of that duration. That, uh, that, that great feeling can turn very dysphoric and, and not in a sense of depression, but with irritability, agitation, uh, they become frustrated with the fact the world around them is not participating in, in their greatness and all their terrific ideas and everything that yeah. they want to try to yeah. share. You know, they, they run up against uh, some opposition to that, of course. And so uh, they, they feel then maybe, uh, and of course, if there's paranoia, that makes it even worse, right? Because now they feel the world's against them and they don't understand. And, and then they become, you know, perhaps very irritable, very, uh, very anxious, and maybe even in some cases, very hostile uh, as well uh, during that period of time. So uh, along with the functional consequences, for example, going on shopping sprees, um, uh, calling uh, at people that you know and, and cursing them out or, telling your boss to you know, go jump in the lake, uh, whatever those uh, possibilities are, uh, 
um, and maybe even making a disturbance in the neighborhood and, and getting the cops called on you. All of these things are uh, so much more severe in their consequences that yes, they get, uh, they get a lot more attention, but that denial tends to be a lot thicker, if you will, as well in those individuals. Now oh. with bipolar two, there's denial too. And, it, and, it's, and it's difficult sometimes to kind of work with that person to kind of break down some of the, the beneficial aspects of it that they perceive and some of those consequences and, and let them know that this is eventually, that this all has to do with bipolar disorder, it's one disorder. But uh, these are some of the differences and how it kind of plays out and why mania and bipolar one might get that initial uh, reaction from people and an attention where bipolar two can be a little bit more stealthy, a little bit more hidden, a little more come and go. Uh, suddenly that person isn't as, as, um, as manic and they're sort of your friend now and everybody gets along and it's easier for the people around that person to kind of go, oh, he's okay now or she's fine again. You know, she goes through those moods and that's kind of her and we just kind of learn to live with it rather than stopping and kind of going, hey, wait a minute, there's, there's something more going on than just moodiness. But this, this really is something distinct. Can a person learn to recognize the signs, the triggers, etc., and learn to kind of surf with it, to not get carried away, but to sort of harness the good part of that energy? Is that pie in the sky or is that possible? Well, I definitely think that many people try that um, even at the time where they gain some sense, some awareness that uh, they may have a bipolar disorder um, or something that's just not uh, typical or normal about themselves that probably should require some kind of attention and care. Uh, most people will try to live with it and sort of harness whatever they perceive to be those beneficial aspects of that disorder. Yeah. Um, and, and even should they initiate treatment, that, that is one of the very common treatment issues that we have, even as we go through stabilization into post-stabilization, after medications are set, one of the, the, the very common issues at that time for people is, will I ever have that great feeling again? Will I ever be able to create again at the level that I used to? And what I think is important in therapy, and certainly what I pay attention to as a therapist in those situations, is to help people to understand that the creative process is not what their mania or hypomania was doing. It certainly was providing fuel in, in a big way, but you still have to have a well-honed skill set for anything that you want to do and accomplish in life. You can't just become a musician because you think it's cool or because you feel so good about yourself, you've always wanted to write the great American novel but have no background in how to write anything creatively. It still requires that you have a skill set, that you have a creative process, and, and not mistake the intense energy and great feelings of mania as that creative process itself. So as people go through therapy, I think they really learn that, and, and there's some grief in terms of that losing that part of their identity mm -hmm. in favor of gaining a better sense of self-organization, of recognizing that creative process, and, and just as importantly, I think, knowing that they can be productive consistently rather than in these peaks and valleys that we call mania and depression, but a more consistent, more fluid approach to being productive and feeling uh, the, the sense of reward uh, coming from that. Yeah. Now, you, you've already alluded to some of the challenges of diagnosis. You say there's often a lot of misdiagnosis. Um, what are the uh, misdiagnoses? What are the things that people mistakenly uh, are not, you know, they're not recognizing that it's bipolar. Instead, they're saying, oh, this is. And you tell lots of stories in the book. Feel free to throw in any case examples, uh, whether they're hypothetical or actual. Right. Well, the, the main one is major depression or what we can call unipolar. That's not bipolar. It's just one pole, the depression, or non-bipolar depression, if you want to call it that. Uh, that is the predominant one. 
Uh -huh. And then from there, um, it's important to understand differences between bipolar disorder and ADHD, for example. They're very frequently, particularly in young people, uh, confused. Now you can have both, but more often than not, it's one or the other and we're confusing one or the other. Is that you. because of, in ADHD, because of the sort of high level of activation and uh, irritability and so on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in, and remember in uh, children, uh, either prepubescent children or adolescent children, um, th their moods can change very quickly for any number of reasons. And, and that's just pretty typical among adolescents. Uh, so we don't always see uh, several days uh, cons of a consistent episode of mania or depression. You might see depression, certainly, uh, like that. But you, you don't always see mania over several consecutive days when it comes to children as that disorder may be emerging. So because their cycling can be kind of rapid, it's, easily to, it's easy to confuse that with other things. One is ADHD, but uh, it also can be confused with the sort of more typical uh, pattern of emotional uh, tumult that you see with, in adolescents anyway, sort of like adolescents gone haywire. Um, so that's not, uh, that's not uh, uncommon. A, a big one, uh, Dr. Dave, has to do with substance abuse, which uh, with bipolar disorder is very, very highly uh, co-occurring. In fact, the research shows that uh, bipolar disorder and substance abuse disorders are even more highly co-occurring than major depression alone. So people that go for treatment with substance abuse disorders are not being misdiagnosed because they certainly are going in with a diagnosis of substance abuse disorder, but what may be missing is the recognition of what I would describe as an underlying bipolar disorder a bipolar disorder that they had their whole life that they, they certainly had to one extent or another prior to their substance use pattern uh, emerging. Can we assume uh, that this is, is a, uh, a self-medication that they've kind of unconsciously been self-medicating? Yes, and actually we talk about that quite a bit in owning bipolar and there is one particular story about, about that, but this is the story of many, many, many people who um, don't necessarily know it at the time they're doing it, but hopefully recognize it at some point in their therapy that they've been using uh, substances of all kinds to basically treat their bipolar disorder one way or another. And, and that's, I think that's more uh, understandable uh, from the depression side. Certainly nobody likes depression. I mean, some right. people kind of romanticize it a little bit poetically speaking, but, but I don't think anybody really likes depression. Um, and I think that uh, that, uh, that may be true that, that there's a, a real self-medicating kind of component to that. Uh, but also on the manic side, where sometimes people are basically uh, extending that sort of great feeling out beyond what the mania itself would do in a limited fashion, but also because uh, there's an increase in, pulse of, in impulsive behaviors associated with mania. People feel bulletproof, they feel like uh, life consequences don't apply to them, and that just uh, kind of gives them a more liberated feeling to, to experiment and use substances. But I think ultimately it's all about self-medication, particularly where alcohol and cannabis are, are concerned. Um, along with some of the, uh, any a number of drugs that people uh, find uh, to their liking, yeah, for sure. So, so again, uh, when it comes to um, treating substance use disorders, because there is such a high co-occurrence of bipolar disorder, I really encourage anybody that's working in the recovery field to recognize that and to understand bipolar disorder, uh, because if, if we don't, at some point, uh, assess and treat for those mood swings, I think we put that person at a high risk for relapse uh, when, when they may very sincerely be trying to stay sober uh, for the long term. Mm -hmm. Do you think most therapists are well prepared to treat, to recognize and treat bipolar? 
I, I think the statistics really challenge how prepared we are. I really do. Um, in addition to um, the, the research that shows that about two thirds, I think uh, the, the study that I particularly looked at recently said 69%, so I'd say roughly two thirds of, of people with bipolar are misdiagnosed and as a result of misdiagnosed, mistreated. Um, we also know that the average number of health professionals consulted before uh, a bipolar diagnosis is provided is about four. And, and, we're, and we're not talking about consulted for other things. We're talking specifically about that psychological psychiatric presentation. So about four, an average of four. And, and, and here's another statistic that, that I always quote, and every time I say it, it just, it, it really gets to me. Um, that um, the average time for a person who has experienced their first bipolar mood episode and the time they actually receive treatment specific for bipolar disorder is 10 years. Wow. So that's a 10 year gap in treatment. And that's just the average. So you can think about outliers. And, yeah. and when, 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 when bipolar two uh, subjects are taken out of that pool of bipolar in general, their average is about 15 years. Huh. And look at that in relation to what I just talked about in substance abuse disorders, the high um, uh, suicide rate uh, among people with bipolar disorder. You know that, that people with bipolar disorder are at least 20 times uh, more at risk for suicide than the general population. So during this whole period of time where this person is perhaps seeking care to one extent or another, and there's all of these missed opportunities, which may go 10 years and, and more, you know, it, since I published some uh, articles and, and the book and mentioned that 10 year gap in treatment, I've had a number of people come to me and say, you know, it took me exactly 10 years. So, wow. so I know that, uh, that, this, that the research is, is really on the mark there. Yeah. Um, so, what's going on in that person's life for all yeah, those many years? Right, exactly. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> what yeah. is going on? Lots of suffering, really, I think. Uh -huh. um, mistreatment. And I don't mean mistreatment like abuse, but I mean they're, they're not being treated properly for, for the diagnosis that they really have. They may be treated for other things along the way, like substance abuse, like relationship problems, and so forth. Maybe the depression, but not the bipolar disorder in a way that can really stabilize mood uh, on an ongoing basis. And who else is suffering? But the loved ones, the family members, the people around that individual yeah. who can't understand what's going on, um, who um, either have to sort of manage a cope through denial in their own lives and not really see what, what's going on as their coping mechanism, or become hostile and angry at the individual who is not getting well and is still uh, fluctuating in their moods and in their behavior. I always tell people that bipolar can make a very good person do very bad things. Hmm. And again, that stretch of many, many years uh, before that person may be accurately diagnosed, if at all, if they're still alive and they still have that opportunity available to them. Um, yeah, there's a lot of suffering along that, along that trail, for sure. Wow. wow. And I think one of the things that's so important about what we're trying to do, and, I, and owning bipolar, I think, is a part of that, and the conversations that we're having, is to begin to close that 10-year gap of treatment. Mm -hmm. Again, not relying on the professional community by itself. Certainly, we as professionals can do a whole lot better, myself included, um, but uh, that the community, patients and families, and the larger community, outside of that sort of small, tight-knit group we call you know, mental health professionals, can recognize and understand and be more supportive of people uh, getting the care that they need. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the psychotherapy side of the equation. Is, uh, you've come out pretty strongly for uh, appropriate medications as being maybe the, the go-to, at least initially, the go-to solution or the beginning of the go-to solution. Right. What about the talk therapy part of it. What happens there? Um, so in my book, Owning Bipolar, and in the clinical trainings that I provide, 
uh, I talk about a three-phase approach to bipolar therapy. Okay. And those phases are centered around the medical stab uh, stabilization of uh, bipolar mood swings. Um, the first phase is that pre-stabilization phase. That's before medications are really uh, not only presented, but effective. And there is there's a period of time to make that happen. And it's different case by case. Um, but the pre-stabilization phase is, and I think we've talked about it already, is marked by denial. Um, uh, that's, I think, really the main feature. It's marked by the consequences of, of untreated bipolar disorder, uh, whether it's financial problems, health problems, relationship issues. All of these things are, are part of the bipolar crisis and so that bipolar kind of, is affecting. They, they kind of need to own up to it, using your word owning again. They kind of need to own up to, I've got this problem in my life. Right, and that and that and that that happens uh, in in different at different levels through the process. Sure. But indeed, that's where the education and assessment part comes, and the and the conversation begins by separating the 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 perceived beneficial aspects with with ones that uh, are, um, I guess harder to deny that have that negative impact in that person's life. So we're, we're, we're less focused on telling people you have bipolar disorder, because what does that mean to them anyway? But we can say, yeah, there are moments when you have experiences that are very exciting, very uh, thrilling, uh, you're experiencing a high, but there's, there's another side to that. Let's talk about that other side. And let's talk about the symptoms that, and the parts of what you're going through that you don't like. And, and enter that conversation and help people to identify what their fears and concerns are uh, about all of those things together and really begin to have a conversation about that, uh, an assessment process uh, that really nails down a bipolar disorder diagnosis, if indeed that, that's what's going on, and then begin a medication conversation. And as it gets closer, I think, to answering your question, um, you know, we as therapists, I think too often, try to scuttle that part of the discussion to the physician because maybe we don't feel qualified to talk about that. Um, I think all therapists, uh, certainly those that are going to assess and treat people that have bipolar or any other kind of mood disorder or anxiety disorder, OCD, et cetera, that would benefit from medication to have at least some understanding and some knowledge about what those medications are because we as therapists talk about it more very often than even the doctors do by virtue of the fact that they tend to have more contact with us. And, and I think doctors appreciate that more and more anyway. It's not a turf thing like it maybe it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I think doctors and therapists uh, collaborate more in, in this generation and, and that's great to see. So we're gonna enter a conversation about medication and help to, as we talked about a little bit earlier, allay some of the fears, uh, get the facts out, what to expect, and, and, and not to create a rosy picture either. Uh, uh, moving from pre-stabilization to stabilization, the next and second phase, um, can be really rough for people. Sometimes the medication process goes very well. Yay, we all are excited about that. But we have to expect that there's going to be uh, some experimentation, some trial, and uh, it may take more than one medication. It may take uh, two or three, at least in the beginning, to really address the symptoms based on their severity and so forth. And during that time, we're also helping family members, in a sense, to stabilize, not medically, but, but psychologically, because of everything that they've been through with bipolar disorder. We can't leave the family members out. So often, people um, around the bipolar person, the person with bipolar disorder, will say that they feel like, okay, my loved one is getting treatment and getting help, but what about me? What about what I've gone through? Mm. And yeah. it's not just like, hey, uh, you're, uh, you know, she's on medication now, so you should be fine, and we're all gonna be fine. Well, we know that psychological pain and the trauma that we went through doesn't just go away. It needs to be understood and addressed in that context as well. And ultimately, it helps everybody going forward. And, as, and as, so as the individual stabilizes, the family the support system does as well. We move into the third phase, which is hopefully very long, and that's the post-stabilization phase. And that's where we move from treating symptoms in the beginning by breaking them down to lacing them together and what we call bipolar disorder, but then treating the whole person, not just the bipolar disorder. 
but all of their personal self-esteem, identity issues, family dysfunctional uh, issues that may have either been created by polar disorder or by other factors, and, and, and help that person and the support system around that person to have a communication together that's more effective. You know, one of the things, uh, Dave, that, that people often say when they're in that post-civilization phase is that I don't want my loved one to tell me that hmm, you're really upset. Are you off your medication? You know, that, that, that they don't want everything to be looked at as bipolar disorder. They want to be looked at for who they are. And they're discovering that through that process themselves. Mm -hmm. But they often desire that the family, the loved ones, develop a communication by which we can talk about bipolar if necessary, but we can also talk about what it is to really experience real feelings that have real causal connections with our, our immediate circumstances. So there's so much to talk about in therapy going forward from that perspective. And that when people develop that communication together, they really do thrive, I think. And, um, and, and one more thing to talk, uh, just to mention about that phase that I think is a very important part of therapy. And that is, I tell people always, when they get into post-stabilization, no matter how thankful they are about treatment, that at some point they're going to think about getting off their medication. And they may or may not do that, but they're going to consider it. And that is also a feature of that post-stabilization phase. And, and I think very important to talk about proactively, but create a conversation with that individual where they don't feel ashamed that they should call um, the therapist and say, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. What do you think? Um, and I encourage people to do that, whether they're in uh, sessions with me currently, or uh, they don't require sessions right away, or maybe it's on an as-needed as basis, to either come into my office or give me a phone call and say, hey, I'm thinking about getting off med medication, and I want to talk to you about it first. So I always invite people to do that, recognizing that at some point or another, they're going to think about it, and they may even try sure. to sure. prevent them from having that crisis all over again. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about the length of treatment, because since they're going to have this condition their whole life, presumably they're not going to be in active therapy their whole life, most people. Uh, so is there a sort of a typical length of time that uh, you see clients who are bipolar? Um, I think certainly for as they go through stabilization, that's a very intense time and a very uh, important time to stay connected with therapy. Now the frequency may vary from person to person depending on their individual circumstances, but it has to be very present and the issues are very contemporary. So um, uh, that's not something that, okay, you're gonna go see the doctor for medication, come back and see me in two months. I would never say that as a therapist. But now having gone in through post-stabilization, if, they're, if they have met some of those typical post-stabilization objectives, then certainly we can expect that their, that their therapy, and, and I, was, I was trained, and I think many people are still trained, that, that you have to have a termination point of therapy. Um, but I think that that has to be somewhat flexible. Certainly they, an individual may come to the point where they feel like they've achieved as much benefit from therapy as they can in their present life. And, and if that's agreed upon with the therapist and, and doctor as a part of that treatment team, then by all means. One of the things that I think is most important as a therapist in all circumstances when somebody comes to that point and we agree upon that together is that just because therapy ending, is ending doesn't mean that the need for therapy won't come up at some point in that person's life. And to know that they are welcome to call me or any other therapist that they might want to um, 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 reach out to is what's really ultimately important. Just as you said, the, their, their care for bipolar disorder never goes away. It goes on through their lifetime. But it does change in terms of uh, what those needs are, and uh, specifically in terms of the frequency of contact, uh, depending on what's going on in their lives. Yeah. Well, I'm feeling like we might be uh, getting near our winding down time, and I'm wondering if there's anything maybe that we haven't touched on that you were hoping to get to? Uh, you know, I always tell people the most important thing to understand is that you're not alone. In spite of how you may feel today, 
So if you're suffering with bipolar disorder or you have a loved one who is, and you don't know what to do, there's help available. And, and sometimes, again, acquiring that help may be a bit of a struggle, but, um, but never give up. And know that there's a community of people that, that uh, are aware of this. One of the things that I, I did years, years ago and very proud of is uh, I started what's called the Bipolar Network. And there's BipolarNetwork.com and Bipolar Network uh, Facebook page, which has ongoing information. But also, and I think more importantly, stories from people who have gone through uh, the bipolar experience and what that's like. And it's important to share those stories in the book. Also, as you mentioned, has stories in it uh, taken from uh, the Bipolar Network and, and other uh, experiences that people have shared with me. Uh, just to remind us that in spite of how we feel uh, in our most des desperate moments, uh, you're, you're not alone. And, uh, and it's important to reach out and keep reaching out uh, even if there's some disruption of that along the way. Uh, because care is possible. Bipolar disorder is a very manageable illness. Um, and it is that ultimately if you don't get treated, but once you're treated, you can have uh, mental health and enjoy uh, the benefits of that through your lifetime. So be sure to always keep that in mind. Okay, that's a great closing message. Uh, Michael Pippich, I really wanna thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you, Dr. Dave, it's a pleasure.